When you live on an island, your life is governed by the sea. It's true here in Orkney, it's true on any islands. And I'm sitting here by the shores of the Atlantic Ocean to tell you a story that is very old. It's a story that people told about the spirits who ruled the sea, one male, one female. Now in the summer months, the sea was ruled by a spirit called the Mother of the Sea. And she brought life to all the creatures in the ocean. And she also stilled the waves so that there was no storms. And the fishermen could push their boats out into the sea and they could go and set their long lines of hooks to catch fish and also set creels to catch crabs and lobsters. But this took a lot of energy from the Mother of the Sea, calming the oceans, giving life. And so towards the end of the summer, she started to grow weaker and weaker. Now the spirit that ruled the sea in the winter was a male figure called Terran. And Terran created storms that cast ships onto the rocks. It was also a difficult time to catch any fish and the crabs hunkered down for the winter and the lobsters went into deeper water, so food was scarce. But Terran was bound at the bottom of the sea. But as the mother of the sea got weaker and weaker, Terran got stronger and stronger until he broke his fetters and the two of them fought a terrible battle. This was around the time of the equinox when we get storms here and the storms, they said, was caused by the Mother of the Sea and Terran fighting. Now Terran would defeat the Mother of the Sea and she would be driven into exile onto the land where she would wander as a spirit, invisible to mortal eyes. But she had to wait there until she regained her power. Terran would unleash the storms he would also unleash the terrible Nuklavi, an awful creature, part horse, part man, with no skin on its body, which would have destroyed Orkney, but it was afraid of fresh water. And so in the winter, he was kept into the sea a lot of the time. But it was a bad time for people with very little food and always that danger from the sea. But all that rage and energy weakened Terran. And eventually, at the springtime, he started to lose his power. While the mother of the sea regained hers, and she would go back into the sea, and the two of them would fight a terrible battle. And this was at the time of the equinox in spring. Again, more gales. Now, the mother of the sea would defeat Terran, and she would bind him and he would be held at the bottom of the sea fetter and the Nuklavi would be locked up as well. And then the rule of the mother of the seas began all over again and there was food and there was calm and peace in Orkney. But of course, she would lose her strength and at the end of the year, there would be another battle and then Terran would rule. And so it goes on goes on to this day, and it will go on forevermore. a giant who lived in Caithness and unlike most giants he had a strange passion a strange hobby he loved gardening there was nothing he loved better than growing plants and growing flowers and and the soil over in Caithness well it wasn't as good as the soil in Orkney and the giant knew that he would look covetously across the Pentland Firth at these green islands lying there. And he thought that some of the earth from Orkney was just what he needed for his garden. 
So the one day, he put a casey on his back, a straw basket, held along the front with a band. And he took his staff in his hand and he waded across the Pentland Firth to Orkney. He was such a huge giant that it was nothing more than like a dock pond to him. He waded up to his knees, past Hoy, and came over to the mainland. And he saw a likely looking spot where the ground looked good and fertile. So he laid down his basket, and with his two huge great hands, he took a great scoop of earth, and he dumped it into his casey, into the basket. And then with his other hand, he took another huge scoop of earth, and he dumped it in the basket, and that filled it. And then he slung it onto his back, and he turned around to go. Now he left two great holes in the surface of Orkney, and water flowed into those holes, and it made the Stennis and the Harry Lochs. Now the giant set off back home to Caithness, loaded up with good, fertile Orkney soil. And as he was going along, there was a great big lump of turf fell off from the top of his basket, into the sea with a splash. And there it remains to this day, and we call it the island of Gramsy, and that's it just behind me here. Well, he paid no attention to that, he carried on going. But after a short time, disaster befell him because the band, the fettle that held the casey on his back snapped, and all the earth fell down with a wallop onto the land. And there it remains to this day, it's the hills of Hoy, which you can just see behind me here. Well, the giant was so despondent that he just took his basket, and he went home, and he never came back and troubled the folk in Orkney again. beautiful west coast of Orkney at Yesnaby. And the story I'm going to tell you dates back to the Viking Age. Now, there was a king in Denmark called King Frodi. And during Frodi's reign, there was a quernstone found in the land, a huge millstone so big that no one could turn it. But the king had it brought back to his palace and it was taken to one of the cellars and set there. Now, a short time after, he went to visit his friend, the king of Sweden. And he saw that at the Swedish king's court, there were two giant bond maidens, two giant slave women, whose names was Fenia and Menia. Now they were of the race of giants, and Frodi asked the king of Sweden if he would sell them, these two maidens. And the king of Sweden agreed, and so Fenia and Menia were bought and brought back to Denmark, and they were taken to the king's castle and down the stairs, down to that cellar where the giant quernstone sat and he ordered them to grind it. And they were so huge that they could turn this millstone. Now, the reason that Frodi was so keen to have them grind for him was because this was no ordinary millstone. This was a magic one, and it would grind out whatever the owner ordered it to and Frodi ordered them to grind out gold. And gold flowed out from between the two stones, 
and Frodi filled his treasury right up to the ceiling with gold. He filled other rooms with gold too, until there was no room for any more gold. And then he asked Fenya and Menya to grind out something else for him. He wanted them to grind out peace and plenty and prosperity for the land. And while you could see nothing coming out from between the stones, what flowed out was good luck and fertility and peace and harmony. So all the land became so fertile and so peaceful, it was like heaven on earth. All the barley stalks were hanging heavy with grain, fruit was hanging on the trees, and all the animals, all the sheep and the cattle, they all had twins, and the horses had twins, and all the chickens and ducks laid so many eggs, and they had so many young running around their feet they could hardly move. And also, the fish in the sea was so plentiful that you could have walked from Denmark to Norway on the backs of the shoals of herring. Everybody was happy. Peace reigned throughout the land. War was something that was forgotten. Strife was forgotten. There wasn't even an argument between families. Everyone was happy except for two people. Fenya and Menya. They weren't allowed to rest. They had to turn those millstones day and night. So they asked King Frodi, can we have a break? Can we have a little rest? And Frodi, well, he was loath to grant them that wish. He said, you can rest for as long as a cuckoo will hold its peace or long enough for a song to be sung. Well, Fenya and Menya did not like that answer. And they sang a song, and it was a terrible song. It was a song of hate, a song of disease and famine. And as they sang it, bad luck flowed out from between the stones, they carried on singing that song, Grotesunger, it was called, the Song of Groti. Well, the bad luck covered the land, and all the crops failed in the fields and rotted. The animals died, the fish went away, and the people died of diseases as well, but they also fought. They fought with each other. It was a time of terrible strife. Father killed son, and son killed father. Oh, it was terrible to see. And armies invaded the land as well. The slaughter was terrible. Now one day, a fleet of longships appeared at the harbour, at the town where Grotti lived. It was a sea king called Miesinger. And Miesinger attacked the castle where Frodi lived, and Frodi was killed there. Now Miesinger carried away Fenya and Menya and the great millstone Grotti. Now he knew what these millstones were capable of. That's why he took them. And as he set sail in his longship, he told Fenya and Menya to grind him salt. Now salt was a valuable commodity in the Viking Age. It was difficult to obtain. It was expensive. So they ground out salt. They ground out heaps of salt. And they said to Miesinger, have you got enough salt now? And he said, no, carry on grinding salt. And so they did. They ground out so much salt that the long ship was smothered in it, and they sank to the bottom of the sea. Now Fenya and Menya went down with the ship, and so did the millstone, and they came to rest at the bottom of the sea. 
but they were of the race of giants. They were not mortals, and so they didn't die, and they lived there yet, and they still turned the quernstone. Now, where they landed was in the Pentland Firth between Orkney and Caithness, just east of the island of Stroma. And there is a whirlpool there that is known as the Swelke, Svelgar in Old Norse, meaning the swallower, because it swallowed ships whole. Now, that is caused by the water that flows down through the hole in the eye of the millstone as it turns. And to this day, Fenya and Menya are still grinding out salt at the bottom of the sea. And that is why the sea is salt. <laughs> Ein hallo Frank, ein hallo free, ein hallo stands in the middle of the sea. We are roaring roost on either side, ein hallo stands in the middle of the tide. That was a rhyme that me mother told me when I was a PD boy. And it's about the island of Ein Hallow, which you can just see behind me here. Now, it takes its name Ein Helga from the Vikings, meaning a holy island. But, you know, it didn't always used to be there. And this is the story of how Einhallow became part of Orkney. Now, there was once a man called Thoradale, and he lived here in Evie. And he went to the fishing, and he had a small croft. He was married, and they had three grown-up boys. But sadly, his wife died. And after a while, he decided that he would marry again. There was a girl in the parish who was a very bonny lass, and he liked her, and she liked him. So the two of them were married, and they were very happy together for a short time. And the stepmother got on very well with the three sons as well. Everything seemed good. Until one day, the two of them went down to the shore to gather shellfish for bait for the fishing. And the man was sitting down on a rock to tie his shoelace, when he heard a scream from his wife, he turned around and he saw a Finn man carrying her off into his boat. Now, the Finn men live under the sea, but they also live on islands that float on its surface, and they use magic, and they also use magic to propel their boats. And when the Finn man got Thoradell's wife into the boat, he pulled on the oar and it shot across the surface of the sea like an arrow from a bow and was not seen again. Now Thoradell went down on his knees below the low water mark and he swore by the Moorstein that he would have his revenge on the Finn folk some day. He did know when, he did know how, but he would have vengeance. Now some time later he was out fishing between the mainland here on Evie, and the island of Rousey, which is across there as well, the big one. Now, in those days, there was no Ein Hallow there at all. And as he fished, he heard a woman sing, and he recognized the voice as being that of his wife, who had been lost. And she sang, Good man, greet no more for me, for me again you'll never see. But if a vengeance you'd have joy, Go spear the wise spay wife ahoy. What she was telling him was that he would never see her again, so not to weep for her, but if he would want his revenge, to go to the island ahoy to see the spay wife, a witch. And that's what he did. He headed home. He took a staff and he took silver and he headed off to the island ahoy and there he met the spay wife. And the spay wife told him all that he had to do she said that the Finn folk hate more than anything else to lose any part of Hildeland, their hidden land, the islands that float on the surface of the sea, which are usually invisible to mortal eyes. She said that if they lost any bit of that, they would hate that more than anything else, but no mortal man could see it. But she told them what he must do to get the power to see Hildeland. He went home, 
and for nine nights, on the night of the full moon, he went to the stones of Stennis, and next to the stones there used to be a stone called the Odin Stone, which had a hole all the way through it. Now he went down on his knees, and he went nine times around the stone, and then he looked through the hole. And on the end of the ninth night, of the night of the full moon, he looked through the hole, and he was shown what he must do in order to see Hilderland. He went home, and he told his sons to prepare everything. He got a great big chest, and he filled it full of salt. And he had three cases ready. These are straw baskets you wore on your back. And he told the boys that they had to be ready. As soon as he gave the order, they had to go down to the boat and they had to start to row. Now one day Thoradell got up and he went outside and he yawned and stretched and he looked down over the hillside and there was a beautiful island where there had never been an island before. He shouted to his boys to get ready, and they set off with the big chest full of salt, and they headed down to the boat noust, and they pushed the boat into the sea, and they started to row. Now, the boys couldn't see the island, only their father could, and he couldn't take his eyes off it for a second, because if he did, he would never have the power to see it again. Now, as they rowed out, suddenly there was a great school of whales came swimming up, and the boys said to their father that they should try to steer them ashore, because if they could beach them, they would be able to get the oil from the whales and make a lot of money. But the man said, no, carry on going. Now, now one of the whales, the biggest of the lot, broke away from the others and it swam towards the boat with its mouth wide open like it was going to swallow it. And the boys panicked, saying that they should get out of there. But the father knew it was just the trick of the fin folk. And he took a handful of salt and he threw it at this whale and the whale disappeared. It was just a phantom conjured up by the magic of the fin folk. Well, they carried on rowing a bit further, and the mermaids who were sitting on the shores of the island started to sing the most beautiful song. And when the boys heard it, oh, their hearts melted, and they started to row slower and slower. But Thoradell said, told them to get rowing and gave the nearest one a kick. And then he turned to the mermaids and he said, Begone, ye unholy limmers. And he threw a cross at them. It was a cross made out of dried tangles, of dried kelp stems. Now at the sign of the cross, the mermaids screamed and dived into the water and swam away. Now, next thing the boys knew, the boat grounded on an island which they hadn't seen before. And there, in front of them, stood a huge monster. Thoradell jumped out the boat and headed towards it. It was a monster with tusks as long as a man's arms, and it spat flame from its mouth, and it had feet as broad as millstones. But Thoradell took a handful of salt and threw it at the monster, and it disappeared with a growl leaving in its place a fin man, a fin man he recognized. It was the one who had stolen his wife. And the fin man had a drawn sword in his hand, and he said, Begone! I know why you've come here, you human thief. You've come to steal part of Helderland for the fin folk. But unless you go now, I'll defile the island's soil with your nasty human blood. Well, the sons were afraid. They shouted to their dad to come back to the boat, but he wouldn't go. The fin man thrust at him with the sword, but he stepped to one side, and he had another cross made, of a kind of a sticky grass known as cloggers, and he threw it at the fin man, and it stuck on his forehead, and it burnt into his flesh, and he couldn't pull it away because that would burn his hands as well. 
and he ran off roaring in pain. Now Thoradil ordered his sons to get ready. They brought the salt ashore, they filled the baskets with it, and they went around and around the islands, three times each, three abreast, sowing rings of salt all the way around Einhallow. And while they did that, Thoradil cut nine crosses into the turf of the island. Well, the Finn folk raged, they shouted, they cursed, and the mermaids screamed and wept. And all the blue cattle that the Finn folk had on the island all bellowed, and they all ran down the slopes and into the sea, and all of them disappeared. The sons carried on sowing the rings of salt around the island until, in the end, eight of the rings were completed. But the youngest son, who had big hands, hadn't quite completed the ninth ring before he ran out of salt. And he asked his brothers if, he could, if they could give him a, a bit of salt to finish off the last ring, but they didn't have any to spare. And so the last ring of salt was never completed around Einhallow. And you know, to this day, they say that no rats, cats, or mice can live on the island. And that if you tether an animal there with an iron stake, it will pop out of the ground again, the stake, at sunset. And if you cut any corn after sunset, the stalks bleed. You see, that last ring was never finished. And there is still Finn folk magic that exists on that island of Einhallow. <laughs>
that not once had this creature actually tried to harm him. So he sat there and he waited for a while, and sooner or later, there was a figure appear at the door again, the same creature, glowing with a soft green phosphorescent glow. And he came in and he chibbered away in this language he didn't understand, but the man sat and listened to him. Now, he soon started to recognize words here and there, and eventually he pieced together what he was trying to tell him. He said his name was Hugbo, and he lived in the sea, but he was tired of gnawing on dead men's bones, and now he wanted to come and live on land, and he wanted to live on the island of Coppensea, and he told the farmer that if he did this, he would grind him some meal on his quern stone every night that was enough for the farmer to make a pot of porridge for himself for breakfast in the morning. The farmer thought that any help at all would be good, and so he agreed, and he went back to his bed while Hugbo started to turn the quern stone and grind the grain for the porridge in the morning. Now, this was fine, time passed, and Hugbo just became a regular fixture in the house, and some nights him and the man would sit and they would talk together, and other nights the man would go to his bed and Hugbo would just turn the quern stone and he would fall asleep to the gritty chuckle of the quern stones, grinding the porridge for the next day. But then it occurred to the man that he was getting married soon. He had somebody else to think about as well as just himself. So he went over to Dearness, and he went to see his sweetheart. And he told her all about this strange creature, Hugbo, and that he was helping him on the farm. And he kept them company in the evenings. And she said, if he's all right with you, he'll be all right with me. So he said, I think you'd better come over and meet him first. So he took her over to Coppensey on the boat, and she met Hugbo, and she said she was fine with him. And so the two were married, and they went to live on Coppensey. But as time passed, the wife became more and more annoyed by the presence of Hugbo. And the one thing that upset her more than most was that he was naked. He hadn't a stitch on him. And so she thought this wasn't right for a respectable married woman like her shouldn't see this little naked creature going waddling along. And his flat, bald head really annoyed her too, until it got to the stage that everything about Hugbo annoyed her. And so one day, she got an old cloak with a hood on it, and she patched it up, and she left it lying on the quernstone rather pointedly for Hugbo to find. It was her way of saying, cover yourself up, man. She also thought that the hood would cover that bald head that annoyed her as well. Well, that night they went to bed, and just as they were falling off to sleep, they heard the most terrible howling and wailing. And there was Hugbo holding the cloak and hood, and he ran round and round on the floor saying, Hugbo's gotten a cloak and hood, so Hugbo can do no more good. And he ran out the door into the darkness of the night, and they never saw him again. You see, the deal that he had made with the farmer had been broken, and he had been paid with a cloak and hood. Now I'm sitting here at Dingushawi in Dearness. The Vikings named the place Dingushawi. It means the assembly mound. This is where the Vikings held their parliaments, held their courts. But it's also a famous fairy mound. And there is a story about a fiddler who went in the mounds to play for the fairies. But that's another story. Now the one I'm going to tell you, it comes from the island of Rousey. There was two men 
Robbie and Chalk, and the two of them were inseparable. They'd been best of pals since they were bairns. They used to play together, and then when they got older, they worked together. And they raised enough money to buy a boat and go fishing together. Now, one day they had been out fishing for a bit longer than they had expected. It, it was good catch, and so they were a bit late getting ashore. And as they were walking home, they had to go up through Quandle, through the valley on the west side of the island. Now, they heard music, the sound of the pipes playing, and they followed it, and they saw a great mound, and the music was coming from that. And when they went around the side of it, they could see that there was a doorway standing wide open. Now, they went into the door, but Robbie had a knife on him, because he was a fisherman, they always carry a knife. And he knew that steel was a protection against anything evil or any magic, so he stuck it above the door and he walked in. Now the two of them were inside, and they saw the fairies dancing. They were all dressed in blue and white, and all going round and round. And Robbie says to Chalk, I think it's time we were leaving. So they headed back towards the door, and Robbie pulled out the knife with the, the steel blade, pulled the root fee above the door, and off they went outside. But Chalk didn't have a knife. He didn't have steel to protect him, and he couldn't leave that mound. And the next thing Robbie knew, to his horror, the door slammed shut and had disappeared. Well, he tried and tried to get in, but he couldn't. He went to get his friends, and they went and searched for the mound, but they couldn't find it. Now a year passed, and Robbie was back at the fishing again. And when he got ashore, he was walking home the same route he'd taken before, when he heard a familiar sound. It was the sound of the pipes playing. So he went up to the mound, and there was the doorway standing open, and he looked in, and he could see Chalk was still standing in there. So he ran home as fast as he could, and he got a second knife. And he also got a steel hoop from a barrel, and he ran back down to that mound as fast as he could, and he went to it, and he drove the two knives above the door, and then ran into the, inside the mound, and there was Chalk. And he threw the steel hoop right over Chalk, just like a coit, and then he grabbed them, and he pulled them out, and they both pulled the knife out from above the door, and they were both able to leave safe and sound. Now, it took Chalk some convincing to believe that he had been in that mound for a year, because to him it just seemed like it had been a few seconds. And the strange thing was as well, is that that basket of fish on his back from the previous year was still as fresh it's the hour it was caught. Well, the two men, they went back, and they still went fishing after that. But they always made sure that they took a slightly different route home. And if they saw a mound, they just went right past it. Newark Beach in Dernis, and this story was said to have taken place at a sandy beach in Dernis, and I always kind of felt that it would have been this place. Now there was a young man who had been out late one night. What he was up to, I have no idea, none of my business, but he was coming home late one night, and he heard music. And he thought this was very strange. Where would music be coming from at that time of night? So he very carefully and very cautiously went along the shore to see who was making the music. And he came to a piece of rock that stuck out from the edge of the wee cliff. And he hid himself in that and he peeped around the corner. And he saw that 
where the rocks ended, there was a beautiful sandy beach. And that on that beach, there was lots of people dancing, dancing in the moonlight and all around them lay dark shapes like animals lying asleep. The music was coming from two men who sat on a flat rock playing fiddles. And the dancers danced and danced. The joy of their dance was something to behold. Now the man was curious, so he got down on his belly. And very carefully he crawled among the rocks and seaweed until he got to the beach, to the sandy place where all those animals were lying asleep. And he went to see what they were. And when he got there, he discovered that they were skins, seal skins, empty seal skins. So he knew that this must be the Selkie folk. Selkie folk are people who have, some say they've drowned and they have to remain in the sea as seals. But at certain times of the tide, they can come ashore and take their skin off and dance in human form, but they have to be back in the sea at sunrise. And this was the Selkie folk, the seals who could transform into humans. And this was the night that they could dance. Now, one of the skins he noticed was more beautiful than the rest. It was a lovely silvery colored skin. And he rolled it up, he pat it under his jacket, and he went back to his hiding place. And he stayed there watching the dancing all night long until the first rays of the sun peeped above the horizon and the music stopped and they all ran down to their skins and pulled them on and dived back into the sea as seals again. All except for one young woman who frantically searched for her skin. She couldn't find it. And she searched among the rocks and the seaweed until she ended up running right around the corner of that cliff right into the young man's arms. And he grabbed her and held her and he looked into her beautiful, frightened face. And he thought she was the most beautiful woman he had ever seen in his whole life. And he knew that he would never be happy unless he had her as his wife. She had other plans though, mind you. She punched him and kicked him and scratched him and Screaking out to her in the selkie tongue because selkies have their own way of speaking as well. But he was bigger than her and he carried her home where he lived with his mother. Now, what his mother said when she seen him coming home with a naked girl under one arm and a seal skin under the other, I don't know. But she was no fool. She knew exactly what this girl was. But she was a good, kind buddy. And she felt sorry for the girl who sat by the side of the fire and wept and wept and wept. And the old woman was good to her. She went away to a kist in her room and she took out a dress that she had worn when she was young. And she gave it to the selkie woman, dressed her in it. And she tried to comfort her, but still she wept. But after a while, the tears stopped. And the selkie woman started to take an interest in things that was going on. And the old woman was happy to teach her how to cook and how to spin wool and how to brew ale and all these things that she'd learnt when she was a young woman. She now taught to the young Selkie woman. And it was obvious that the Selkie woman was very fond of this young man as well. She followed him around everywhere. And there was a great love grew between them. And the two of them were married. And as the years went by, bairns were born to them, said to be the finest looking bairns in all Adernus. Well, Things went fine for a while, 
But one day, the Selkie wife took her husband to one side, and she said to him, You know I'm a creature of the sea, and I know that you have my sealskin, and I know where you keep it as well. You keep it in the kist in the bend end of the hoose. That's a big wooden chest. The bend end was the best room in the house. She says, I know that you keep it locked up in the kist in the bend end of the hoose. And I know you always keep the key with you. But I want you to make me a promise. I'm a creature of the sea. And if I ever get that key, I can't promise you that I won't go back to the sea again. So if you love me, if you really love me, then never let me get that skin because I don't know if I would have the strength to stay here or go back to the sea. And I don't want to leave you in the burns. I promise, he said, I won't. Now, a wee while later, it was the time of the Lammas Fair in August. And the Lammas Fair was a great event. Everybody came from all over Orkney, they came from Shetland, they came from Scotland. And everything was brought into Kirkwall that you could sell. So there was a great market, a great fair, and there was many games and things for Burns to be amused with as well. So the farmer decided that he would take his Burns into the toon so that they could have a lovely day. Now his wife decided that she was going to stay at home and give the place a good clean while they were out from under her feet. So the man dressed as Burns in their Sunday best clothes and he put on his Sunday best suit and they headed off in the old horse and cart into Kirkwall. And oh, they had a wonderful day there. The Burns played on rides and they ate sugar on sticks and things that they'd never seen or heard of before. And in the evening when they were tired, they were lying sound asleep in the cart as it rundled down the road, trundling back towards Dernis. Well, when the man got near his hoose, he could see that something wasn't right. There was no lights on in the windows and there was no sign of smoke coming from the chimney. When he got closer, he could see that the door of the hoose was standing wide open. He ran into the hoose and he shouted for his wife, but there was no answer. And then a terrible thought gripped him. He ran through to the bend end of the hoose and there was the kist, wide open, and the skin was gone. And then he realized what must have happened. In his hurry to get dressed in the Sunday best suit, he'd forgot to take the key out of the pocket of his work jacket. And when his wife was tidying up, she wouldn't have been looking for it, but when she picked up that jacket of his and felt the key in the pocket, she knew what that key opened and what was inside waiting for her. She took it out the pocket and she stared at it. And then she went through to the bend end of the hoose and she turned the key in the lock with a click and then opened the lid of the kist and there was her skin. And she picked it up and once she touched it, the urge just to, to hold it next to her was too strong. And when she held it next to her, urge just to feel it against her skin one more time was just too great. And when she did that, she could still smell the salt on it. She knew that she had to go back. She ran down to the shore and with a cry of anger and anguish, she pulled off her dress and she pulled on the seal skin and dived into the sea as a seal once more. Well, the man searched and searched for the rest of his days, but he never once again saw his silky wife. But they did say that when the bairns went down to the shore to play, that sometimes a seal 
would swim backwards and forwards in front of them, sobbing like its heart was breaking.